December 2012 Kyle Wilhoyt, a seasoned cybersecurity researcher, creates an experiment. He builds a water plant, a network of advanced industrial control systems with complicated equipment, full documentation, and a website to boot. According to the legend, the plant is located in the town of Arnold, Missouri. But in reality, it's completely virtual. It runs from a couple of machines in Kyle's basement, sending fake measurements back and forth to imitate activity. The researcher takes a deep breath and connects the system to the internet. The experiment begins. Within several days, interesting things start happening. The plant gets attacked from all sides. North Korean military hackers, Russian ransomware gangs, even trolls from across the US and Europe. They attempt to do all kinds of mischief for fun and profit, connecting to the servers, breaking login pages, and injecting code wherever possible. But among all of them, one attack stands out. Several phishing emails drop into the box of the supposed plant. They're well-researched and written with legitimate looking attachments. One text document hides malware. When launched, the malware scrapes the virtual plant. It finds the equipment documentation and beams that straight to a command and control server. Kyle follows, surprised at the lack of effort it takes to track the attacker. The server's in China. It's big. And it's full. Governmental records, documents, and corporate secrets. Kyle can't believe his eyes. He got them. He found APT1, the hacker group that conducted Operation Shady Rat. At that point, similar stories, almost beat by beat, have been happening worldwide for six years, except that their victims weren't virtual. It all began in 2006, when an employee of a construction company in South Korea received an email with an attachment. It was sent from an address bearing the name of his colleague, but there was something weird about it. Confused, the worker replied to double check, and within several minutes, he got a confirmation. The file's legit. However, the attachment didn't open. Instead, it started a malicious code. A remote access Trojan was launched on the worker's computer. A rat. In just several months, at least eight companies were attacked by the same rat, and dozens more by similar ones. All of these intrusions had the same pattern, a spear phishing email, posing as one from a close acquaintance. It displayed some knowledge of the company, but was written in pretty poor English, as if they were in a hurry. The attachment would hide a rat, masked as a document or some other file. The attackers would converse with the victim and spare no effort to talk their way through their defenses. This is in the era of, you know, we're not worried about attribution. And so it, it's, it's largely companies and organizations that had, by, by today's standards, laughable cybersecurity. I, I remember seeing, uh, you know, some shady rat intrusions where they were emailing screensavers as, as an attachment, right? Um, and, and you look today and you're like, I'm sorry, you, you let a screensaver through the email gateway, right? Um, let alone that the user is like, oh, a screensaver, cool, I'll just download this and run it on my machine. The methods were crude, yet effective. But the most important element wasn't the breach itself. It was what happened later. The attackers didn't run away. They loitered, keeping tabs on the system siphoning all the new data that appeared there. At the same time, they would start moving laterally. Using the gained knowledge and access, they would infect adjacent systems, other computers in the network, other branches of the company. They would repeat the same pattern again and again, building a rat cave under the noses of their victims. The shortest documented intrusion of such kind lasted for around one month. The longest one for almost five years. Their goal isn't to disrupt as much as it's to sit and collect and learn and send data back to the central location. So they need to adapt. It's, it's a lot harder to stay inside of a network without being detected and still be able to observe and be active than it is to um, go in, smash, grab, and, and run off. Such attacks were slowly becoming endemic. Scrambling for answers, the U.S. government started attracting private cybersecurity companies and sharing information with them, hoping to shed some light on the situation. A new name was coined, denoting a hacker group capable of executing such a long-lasting attack, APT, or Advanced Persistent Threat. However, 
It wasn't until several years later that it became clear who the original APT was. The credit for the first counterattack against the rat goes to a treat research team at McAfee. In 2011, they broke into the server where the stolen documents were stored. It housed the logs documenting the rat's victims. Governments, institutions, companies, and other organizations, all the victims were breached by the same method, and all of their documents were siphoned through the same rat caves. Things clicked into place. All the APT activity, which seemed like a bunch of disjointed attacks, were planned and centrally coordinated. It was a part of one operation, and McAfee gave it a name. Operation Shady Rat. In 2013, Mandiant, a cybersecurity-focused subsidiary of Google, managed to get even further. They named the group behind the operation as APT-1, highlighting its size and importance. Then they traced the breadcrumbs left by the hackers. It turned out the people behind this APT worked for a segment of the Chinese military called People's Liberation Army General Staff Department's 3rd Department, 2nd Bureau, otherwise known as Unit 61398. It was located in a military building on the outskirts of Shanghai. Several hundreds of people who worked there were responsible for anything from military reconnaissance and electronic warfare to writing propaganda comments on social media. They were an integral part of the Chinese army and acted like that in every way, from ironclad discipline to incredible resourcefulness. Except for one thing, operational security. Between Mandiant, McAfee, Kyle Wilhoit, and possibly others, a lot of people managed to trace the rat back to its nest. And it wasn't because the Chinese hackers were incompetent or negligent. It was because they just didn't care. In the first years of Operation Shady Rat, they didn't use any of the tools to mask their usage of Chinese internet providers. And their fingerprints were all over the malware. Their attacks were brazen and aggressive, relying more on the poor cybersecurity of the victims than advanced subterfuge. The ones that were there too, it was just, you know, siphon the data and FTP it back to China, right? And I say FTP, like not even using encryption, they're just like back to China directly, right? Um, you know, and so stuff that we, we just would not even consider today. There were job listings. The former employees would include the hacking achievements in their CVs. One hacker even published a scientific paper on his techniques. They weren't subtle at all, right? If, if there's anything you'd say about China, it was like they didn't care about being caught, right? And despite this attitude, the attacks worked. Terabytes of data were smuggled through the rat caves and ended up in the hands of Chinese officers. But for what? intellectual property theft, right? Originally, um, you know, their big goal, certainly through the mid 2010s, um, was technology transfer and intellectual property theft. That would include, you know, access to a lot of new technologies, you know, about up and coming things, because if there's one thing that's known, it's, it's very difficult to create, but it's very easy to replicate and enhance, which China has done time after time. So. If you go back and read China's five-year plans, and they're very public about these, right? In the, you know, the what are we, uh, you know, moving um, uh, domestically to produce over the next five years, and what are, what technologies are we looking to advance? You can overlay that directly with their targets. Lockheed Martin, an American defense manufacturing giant, was one of the first victims of the Shady Rat. In 2007, a rat's cave was dug into its servers. In there laid the plans for the F-35, the latest and most advanced stealth fighter jet the world has ever seen. Just several years later, a remarkably similar aircraft took off for a test flight in China. It was called Shenyang FC-31, and people started to get suspicious. Several leaked reports already stated that the US military was worried about its systems being compromised, but the military denied everything. It wasn't until 2015 when documents leaked by Edward Snowden Confirmed, the F-35 was stolen. And not by a daring maverick or an undercover agent. It was stolen by a person who just sent a bunch of emails to a Lockheed Martin employee, pretending to be his coworker. And this is just one high profile case that we're reasonably certain about. Construction companies, like the South Korean one, where the attacks began. Industrial plants, like the one imitated by Kyle Woolhoit's experiment other factories, offices, and institutions. Countless intrusions that allowed China to copy devices, systems, best practices, 
The rat was bringing home the lumber that fueled the fire, the blaze of unprecedented economic growth. The mainland economy grew by some 400% from 2000. Uh, grown so fast. Almost on steroids. The country has not yeah. missed a single GDP target this entire decade. There were attempts to confront China. We've agreed that neither the U.S. or the Chinese government will conduct or knowingly support cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property. Argue with it. China's foreign ministry on Monday called on the U.S. to immediately withdraw its charges. Even dragged the military hackers into court. Wanted by the FBI. None of them worked. The standard response of Chinese officials has been to vehemently deny that their country conducts any offensive cyber operations and then strike back with the old logical fallacy as old as time. If the U.S. conducts them, why shouldn't we? However, despite those claims, the Chinese APTs started being more careful. They began employing the help of non-state actors and masking their traffic, giving their operations at least a semblance of plausible deniability. The brazenness of the attacks, right, um, you know, really, really drops. And so one of the things that we saw, you know, happen uh, quite a bit after that uh, admonishment, that very public uh, state level admonishment um, is that, you know, they, they, they began routinely using what we call redirectors, right? So uh, basically hopping through some other country's infrastructure instead of the attacks coming in many cases just straight from China. The shady rat ended. The old tools were no longer adequate for the job. The hackers had to be more careful. They couldn't go after so many targets, and the attacks had to change. The reasons for the attacks also changed. The purpose of maintaining presence, of building a reliable rat cave, was no longer to steal information. It was to maintain access in case there was a need for it. In the US, critical infrastructure, is defined as the asset systems and networks that are most critical to our economy and our national security and community well-being and the like. And presumably the end goal there, of, of course, is to stop the functioning of things that, that, are, that are important, get in the way of transportation, logistics systems, the ability to communicate, or the ability of organizations, you, you know, loss of power and things like that. Shady Rat was an immensely important operation for China for many reasons. It supplied the Chinese industry with all the trade secrets it needed and it established China as a major cybernetic superpower. But it also had a much more insidious and much more profound effect. Say you have a rat that has access to a water plant, not a virtual one, but a real plant somewhere in the rural United States. You had a cave leading there for years, and nobody noticed. You stole all the documentation you needed, copied the plant's blueprints, but the cave is still there. In fact, there are lots of those caves leading to many plants across the country. Water, sewage, gas, electricity, all kinds of infrastructure that are critically needed for the functioning of an economy. What could be done with it? What could be carried through all those caves? You know, when I was in government at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, we, we used a nice analogy that I think is still pertinent, which was at the time, you know, I'm talking about the end of the last decade, Russia was sort of, hurricanes and tornadoes natural disaster in China was climate change. Thanks for watching. If you'd like more videos like this, subscribe to let us know. And then check out our channel. Have a nice day.